Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Um, yeah, so um, if the task is to, uh, to come from the outside world and, uh, and provide some fresh and new ideas about the kinds of problems to which maybe uh, GEO might provide uh, some answers to, then I think that my talk should be uh, adequately pitched. I'm going to be talking about knowledge problems uh, with a particular focus on, on Sub-Saharan Africa with a particular focus on official statistics. So what do we know uh, on economic growth, poverty and so forth based on official statistics and what do we not know? Uh, what do states know about themselves? What do researchers know uh, about the problems they're, they're dealing with? We're also going to talk about governance problems. What does it mean for politicians, international organizations, researchers and so forth when this information is, is lacking or indeed um, uh, uh, of poor quality. So before I start talking, I should of course come with a full disclosure and a warning um, that, uh, and it's also as a reminder that uh, studying statistics or official statistics can sometimes seem a bit boring, but sometimes it's also quite interesting and filled with politics. So it might seem like I'm dealing with a technocratic knowledge problem, uh, but it's also a question of political importance. Um, so here's, uh, uh, Stephen was kind enough to mention that Bill Gates uh, reviewed the book favorably as one of the most important books of 2013. In that year I also got some less favorable reviews. For instance, here's the director of statistics in Zambia who has, uh, says it's clear from the asymmetrical information that Mr. German had gathered that uh, he is probably a hired gun. Yeah, meant to discredit uh, official statistical offices. So I just wanted uh, the organizers to know who they brought into this room. Uh, I will not disclose who I was working under, but obviously. Uh, um, uh, so there is, uh, that's just on the line. Uh, we're not dealing just simply about getting to know stuff. There is also about official and unofficial channel, channels as well here. Uh, and that the word uh, validity, often used when it comes to statistics about whether it's accurate or, or not, also as, as this, uh, the, lat the root of the word validity is, is uh, related to the word, word power. So the ability to, to project as a fact as being socially true, while maybe not scientifically true. So I'm going to talk a little bit about knowledge problems across space, across time, and then talk about the governance problems in the end. The, the talk will be mainly focused on my book, Poor Numbers, How We're Misled by African Development Statistics and What to Do About It. And I'll be focusing on mainly uh, chapter one, what do we know, but also some about uh, what to do about it, how do we get around solving it. But I'll leave that a little bit open-ended because I expect solutions to come from the floor. Uh, so first to talk a little bit about why the book and the talk will focus mainly on GDP. So that's the measure of... Uh, whether a country is rich or poor, or whether a country is growing or not growing. Yeah? So it's the, the, the success and failure of economic policies uh, and the, the wealth and, and poverty of nations. And there are many other statistics or metrics that is the, are important when it comes to writing headlines. Uh, the Economist uh, wrote off the African continent as hopeless on the back of declining GDP growth rates in the 1990s. We're now talking about Africa rising and the hopeful continent because these same metrics are now pointing upwards. Um, and I think it's also striking when in the room you're interested in getting the right numbers on a lot of things. And we might be interested in, in poverty, we might be interested in human rights and so forth. On face value, counting GDP, just stacking up what is being exchanged for money versus what is not being exchanged for money should be a relatively easy task. And then if there is particular problems from, from this, then we are maybe in deeper problems in other parts. Um, and there are, which I am happy to take questions on, of course, GDP is hard to measure everywhere, but uh, the argument put forward here is that it's particularly different uh, in, in poorer countries uh, where state's capacity is low, but also the value of economic transactions are low, and therefore the transaction cost of counting them uh, is relatively higher. So, let's start with the knowledge problem. So, on the 5th of November in 2010, Grace Bediaco held a press conference and then announced 
that on the 5th November, the new GDP number for Ghana was 40, almost 45 billion sedi. The preceding day, on the 4th of November, that same number had been tw almost 26 billion sedi. Yeah? So overnight, GDP in, in Ghana almost doubled. GDP per capita went from about $600 to about $1,100. On the 4th of November, Ghana was a poor country. On the 5th of November, uh, Ghana was a middle-income country. On the 4th of November, Ghana was a, uh, 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 eligible for concessional lending from the World Bank. Uh, on the 5th of November, Ghana was a graduate and ready for capital markets. Yeah? So this is good news. We know more than uh, it turns out that... Uh, that Ghana is richer than we thought. But there is also a problem for those who wrote, at least a lot of red faces, about those who wrote reports the day before about what kind of investment is required to take uh, the country into middle income status when it turns out it's just an accounting procedure. Uh, so Todd Moss at the Center of Global Development, one of the central think tanks in economic developments, exclaimed on his blog pages, boy, we really don't know anything. How could, if this could happen in Ghana, probably the most closely watched economy in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, side by side in Nigeria, uh, South Africa and Kenya, then what then of numbers coming out of Angola, Chad, etc. and so forth. UNDP, whose business it is to deliver development, says it's a statistical illusion. The, the, on other indicators, nothing has changed from the 4th or the 5th of November, so they rejected this news as just uh, magic numbers. Whereas Shantar Dravajan, then the World Bank chief economist for Africa, declared Africa a statistical tragedy. And the tragedy, I, I guess, uh, if I was paraphrasing him, would be to say that uh, the tragedy was that he did not know, know how little he knew before that. So. Is Africa then much richer than we think? Well, it seems that Ghana is not an isolated case. Uh, uh, on the fourth, uh, on the seventeenth uh, of April, two thousand and fourteen, uh, Yemi Kale, the director of statistics in Nigeria Bureau of Stat Statistics, stepped up to the podium in Abuja and announced new GDP numbers. By the time he stepped down from the podium, uh, the GDP of Nigeria had increased 89%. By the time he was done with his statement, total GDP in sub-Saharan Africa increased 20%. Yeah? It had outjumped South Africa as the biggest uh, uh, economy in sub-Saharan Africa that afternoon. Uh, I was asked uh, to, to estimate at the time uh, how much I thought GDP was underestimated by in 2012, I was asking the African Affairs, and I said, you know, to translate it into to non-specialist kind of metrics, there is now currently about 40 Malawis inside of Nigeria, types of, in this terms of size of the economic activity not accounted for. Turns out, I got that a little bit wrong, there are 58, yeah? 58 Malawis have now been found inside of Nigeria, and that should tell you a little bit about the certainty about long-run trends in growth, and how many millions are below or ab above the poverty line. So, my general point is that it's not only Ghana, Nigeria and so forth, but this kind of flow of information and the uncertainty about base levels on these very important metrics. So these are the kind of metrics you decide who gets aid and who doesn't, uh, whether your debt share to GDP is adequate or not so you can get more lending or not. Uh, it would be uh, whether you're doing a good job as a state, whether it will be a fraction of tax as a share of GDP and so forth like that. So if you look at those kind of metrics, I took, for instance, for one year, for year 2000, take some of the most importantly used uh, databases in the world and just rank African countries from top to bottom. Yeah. So here's the poor, for, to change it up a little bit, here the poorest countries on the top. Yeah. Uh, so number one. And this is the good news. The data set by Angus Madison, the World Development Indicators in the middle, and the Penn World Tables. This is what economic historians would use. This is what the World Bank would be using. And this is what Jeffrey Sachs, William Easterly, and Paul Collier type of econometrics kind of research would be using. They all agree that Congo Democratic Republic is the poorest country in the world, but their agreement stops. And that number is also probably wrong. But So here... 
You see, for instance, some interesting jumps so that Madison thinks that Liberia belongs in the, uh, in the upper half of the income distribution, whereas uh, Penwell Table thinks it's the second poorest country in the world. Yeah? Um, Guinea takes an am amazing journey from being on the top 10 richest, according to the Penwell Tables, but among the 10 poorest, according to Angus, Angus Madison. The average jump in rankings, so this is all dollar amounts in different international dollars, so don't mind those. They will be different and they should be different. The ranking between them should not, could be a little bit different, but it should not be this kind of different. The explanation for this is that some of these databases are using the new data for Ghana and others aren't. Yeah? So this means that when we're downloading statistics, uh, you really don't know what you're doing. So that then raises the question about World Bank data on macroeconomic statistics like GDP, but other types of that statistics that are is downloadable. And you can download data from 1960 until today on any indicator for all 195 countries. But this is a bit striking in some senses because I know that many of these countries are not yet published those numbers. So they've, you know, so in Equatorial Guinea, no, no GDP numbers being produced there yet. So therefore, why is there GDP numbers in the World Bank database to be downloaded? Where does the data come from? Short. And, and, and how do they, for instance, now deal with comparing the new Nigeria with the old Nigeria. Where did they add the extra Nigeria, the 89%, the 58 Malawis? Where do they enter those into the database? So we're going to ask ourselves, where does the data come from? So here's where they come from, for instance. This is the head, st head uh, office in, in, in Ghana, in, in Accra, the statistical services, uh, where I was conducting my interviews with uh, Mr. Duncan in, uh, before the GDP revision. Uh, when I was, uh, when I used to have here, you see, this is the informal sector right here. It's a peanut saleswoman. Uh, I used to get my lunch from her in between, uh, buy some peanuts from her and so forth. I, I used to ask Duncan, Duncan, is she going to be counted counted in the new numbers? And then Duncan always says, just peanuts. But it turns out when you add them all up together, they do amount to something. Yeah. Here's uh, this junior uh, data entry uh, uh, officers uh, in Abuja and here's the, the survey still in the plastic bags when I was there wanting to get entered. It's not as if Nigeria did not know that their GDP was outdated. They've been working on trying to fix that for, for a while uh, uh, and sometimes it's just resource uh, problems, data problems. It takes a long while from you decide that you don't have any data on the informal sector to going out to the field, getting the stuff, getting it entered, and so forth. And then there are also freak accidents, such as, uh, um, you know, they ordered technical assistance from the IMF, and then the, the, tech, the consultant fell, fell on an air, uh, airport in Dubai and twisted his ankle, so then the GDP rebasing get delayed a year, and so forth, like that. So there's small, uh, small things like that as well. So it should give you National Accounting 101, how to estimate GDP. Um, I guess you've all taken that class in, in school at some point, so I don't want to bore you to death with repetitive details. Uh, suffice to know that uh, GDP is measured by the sum of consumption, investment, and government, so that's the expenditure method, or the income method, so you add up all the wages, all the profits, uh, all the rents in an economy or you add up all the production. Yeah? All of this should be to together. So you can't spend more than what you produce, you can't earn more than you have, uh, you can't consume more than you have earned and so forth like that. Yeah? That's the, the, the system of national accounts. Beautifully, it all adds up together in the textbook. Uh, not so beautifully, it, does not, it creates a headache for statisticians to fill all these categories. Uh, First of all, if you're run, in running a statistical office in Sub-Saharan Africa, we'll have a problem with the consumption. Personal household consumption, you might have that data every five years if you live in a good country. Some countries don't have any data, uh, and you're guessing from year to year. On investment, you have partial data. Government, you have as much data as has been accurately reported. Imports and exports, you'll know what crosses uh, has been recorded as crossing the border in the capital city, you won't know what's going from, uh, from uh, which is perhaps going over a uh, border not recorded and so forth. This is a non-starting uh, prospect because of the many small sector operators do not report it, so you cannot do this uh, particular thing. 
often means that the workhorse of how you actually estimate GDP from year to year is to just add up all the information you have per sector in the whole economy. And then the way you do this is that you add up all the value added you have in agriculture, in manufacturing, in mining, and so forth like that, and you add the sum, and that's the GDP. Yeah? So far, so good. Uh, the problem is that a country like Ghana will not have the time nor the data to get an adequate sum like that for every year. In Norway, you do the same sum every year, and then you compare it with the sum from last year. In most of these countries, you have to rely on a shortcut, which means that you get some kind of proxy of change, so that, for instance, uh, consumption, you know, change in construction, construction sector is actually not a record of all the houses constructed, then maybe you measure change by imports of cement. Yeah? Uh, you actually do not f follow food production from year to year, but you say that maybe cocoa production exports is more or less adequate uh, capturing agricultural growth and so forth and so forth. So there's a bias towards large scale activities and, and small scale activities goes missing. So in the case of Ghana, they last did this in 1993, and then they used these proxies to guess GDP coming up. Turns out that gave them an adequate sum in 94, 95, 96. Then they started guessing, started not knowing exactly what was going on. And turns out in 2010, when they rebased to a 2006 base year, they found out in the meantime that uh, half of the economy had gone missing. Yeah? And there's, that's not so strange. There are things like the mobile phone, uh, education sector, and so forth like that. Same thing in, in Nigeria. When they updated in 2014, they updated their base year from 1990 to 2010. So that meant that in 2014, it's been almost a quarter of a century since you had an adequate picture of what is then now known as the biggest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, I was again, since 2007, I've been bugging the World Bank about uh, trying to figure out what they do when they mend these gaps. How do they fill the data gaps? And they keep sending you back to a, a manual, which is called, uh, and so it's the manual where it says, uh, how do you fill your gaps? Well, we have a method. It's called the gap filling method. And uh, then that's about the information stops around there. And it uh, may be that you borrow data from a, a neighboring country. It may be that you're uh, borrowing data from the region which you're in. Uh, or it might be that you make a phone call to the IMF representative and say, is it 6 or 7% this year? Yeah, and, uh, and so forth like that. So that's when you do. I've been asking them all the time to get access to the raw data to figure out where there are actual gaps and where there is actually just gap filling. Um, and then you've been said the World Bank only has access to this. And they said in an email to me back in 2007, you may want to visit national statistical offices yourself. Uh, so that's, I file that firmly under easier said than done. Uh, uh, but I did my best. So this is uh, the research uh, pro informing the book Poor Numbers, where I went and did interviews at statistical offices in, in Ghana, Nigeria, in Kenya, in Uganda, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, and Botswana. I also did a, a survey of uh, further other countries, bringing me up to, to 29 countries. Uh, luckily, the IMF, both the IMF and the African Development Bank, I uh, was so disturbed by the publication of poor numbers that they all fact-checked the book and did the same survey again on base year. So it's been double-checked by two international institutions the same month. Both of them found out I'm mostly right most of the time, but they also managed to find different things themselves. So the AFDB fact-check does disagree with the IMF fact-check and so forth. It just underlines the problem of actually it's not only hard to figure out what the real GDP is, it's also hard to figure out what is the method of really figuring out the GDP. So that is the extent of confusion and lack of knowledge in this part. So that allows you to give some kind of picture of, for instance, the I'll just browse through here quickly, like in 2013 then the, the base years that were in use, you have some countries that are on a base year from 2006, where the other countries that are accounting as if it's 1980s. Yeah? And uh, Nigeria at that time was at the 1990, but that now has changed to 2010. That was planned for 2013, but not yet. Uh, wasn't done in 2000, 
until 2014, as I said, because of this consultant fell, falling over on the, at an airport. And, and so the main message here is that that's the main reason why you shouldn't be downloading data and, and just ranking countries according to GDP. You actually need to know who made the observation, under what circumstances was the observation made, and is there any reason to think that the observation is biased. Yeah. So this kind of belief that you can download international data from data sets and then get an adequate uh, knowledge uh, of, of what's going on is, is simply not upheld if you start looking at the, the sources and methods. How does this, this also, of course, also changes over time. Um, so that's uh, when you are, so when it comes to approaching whether a measure is, is, is that, uh, is, is uh, problematic, you might then think about whether the measure is, is valid, as in do, does GDP accurately capture the, the total size of the economy? We know now that's not right. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. So it's the same if you have a bathroom scale at home, then you know that your bathroom scale, at least the old one, which had this, you know, the, the pendulum that just goes back and forward, doesn't give you the right weight. Yeah? So it might be off by a couple of kilos, but that doesn't really matter to you because you're only under, interested in whether you're losing or gaining weight, right? So it doesn't matter if that's off by five kilos. That's a validity uh, problem. Uh, uh, that's a reliability problem. So that means that, that uh, if it's, as long as it's mismeasured consistently, it doesn't really matter. The problem then does, of course, appear the minute you are asking your neighbor how much do you weigh and start making donations as, as, a, as a matter of this. Then suddenly it does matter whether your bathroom scale is more off than the other one. And then the confusion of using download, downloaded data like we have been doing is pretty much as if people are exchanging bathroom scales in the middle of the night. So you will not know whether you're gaining weight yourself even. And particularly if it's not, if it's the data are in the hands of people who are not knowing what's going on in the statistical offices. So it means that you have problems across, uh, but if we were looking at Ghana or Tanzania or Nigeria over time and they were just mismeasuring the same way throughout, it wouldn't have a reliability problem. Uh, but they do change uh, the way they do it through time, so you have serious reliability problems. So that means that uh, when we look at what the so uh, what I've done in the book as well is to write a short history of these statistical offices. So what they do and what they don't know uh, over time. Uh, so it's also a, a, the statistical, you know, statistics is of the state, so by looking at the statistical record, you're basically seeing the fingerprint of the state. So if the state does something, the statistical office knows about it. If it ignores something, it's also thoroughly ignored at the statistical office. There are different kinds of governance indicators out there uh, of, you know, credit risk guide or whether you care for human rights and so forth, Transparency International. Another one would be to bring a ruler to the library in, in London School of Economics, bring a ruler and measure the length of the statistical reference uh, shelf of each country. You find that Botswana has several meters, where Equatorial Guinea is a centimeter uh, uh, wide. You also find that there is a, a lot of data in the 60s and 70s, while what is talked about the lost decades in terms of economic growth in the 80s and the 90s is truly lost decades when it comes to statistical reporting. Such as, for instance, Ghana's last published economic survey is in 1983. Yeah. And uh, the same thing if you go up to, to Zambia, you know how national accounts is being done in, in Zambia, but not after 1973. Uh, there are interesting things about the roots of the current system being set in the colonial system, such as, for instance, Uganda is collecting trade statistics in Mombasa. That's a problem if you know where Mombasa is. Mombasa is not in Uganda. Mombasa is in Kenya. Uh, and that made sense for the colonial regime for which anything of any importance had to pass through Mombasa. It does not make sense for Uganda at the moment. And indeed, in 2010, when I was there following the financial crisis, their statistics told the statisticians that they were in a decline. But out on the street of the same window, which is depicted on the cover of my book, showed that there was a boom. All the cement was bought up for the, the coming uh, year, which meant that you know, they were not recording statistic, uh, trade towards Sudan, for instance. So sometimes you get, uh, it's not only about the accuracy of numbers, but what is being counted versus what is not being counted. 
uh, you'll see that there is very much uh, uh, a decline of the state uh, and with a double challenge of the informal economy coming up in the 1980s and 1990s with also the, the basic avenues of administrative statistics also f m becoming insignificant. So when you talk about statistics, you talk about survey statistics, which is a survey which is being done to uh, get information about one type of problem, versus administrative statistics, which is the kind of numbers that the government gathers from day to day ba uh, just to support its basic functioning. Uh, and so there is much less adequate picture of the economy of, through administrative statistics today, meaning a bigger task, a more expensive task through surveying in the 1990s. That's not been helped by that most of the money and most of the will for informational uh, information to be required comes from Washington DC and London and other centers. So that in, since the 1990s we've been interested in, in knowing what's happened to poverty and therefore all countries are being asked to do poverty surveys. Uh, we have the MDGs, 8 goals, 18 indicators and 48 targets and now the sustainable development goals which are distinctly unsustainable when it comes to recording uh, is demanding that these already strained statistical offices gather information about 17 goals, 169 indicators and I don't know how many uh, indicators, I think the what does the economists call them? Stupid development goals. If, you, if you all, all priorities are priorities, you effectively have none. Uh, and that is a problem if you are uh, uh, running a statistical office, because there is a lot of things you could be counting, which you uh, will have to make some discrete choices about. Um, I'll just uh, show you one thing here. Uh, so I've done a lot of... Uh, of uh, studies of, of what happens to the time series of economic growth as the definition changes over time. So here's, for instance, I'll show you, this is how we know what happened to Tanzania from, for the, for the post-colonial decades, yeah? from 1961 to 2001. There is one series produced by statistical offices uh, from 1960 and then that is not reproduced any longer there. There is a 1985 base year going back to 65 and up to 1992. There is a series based in 1976 which runs from 1976 until today and then the latest series before the last one, so this is now there is a new one. Uh, a run is the purple one running from, was introduced in the 2000s and was back cast to 1987. Yeah? These are all growth rates and provides different perspectives of the economy. So when the international databases are creating a picture for us about the economic past of these countries, it has to pick from these observations and kind of make sense of this, because there is no way of keeping all these definitions constant through time. And so if you do uh, the different national account files, the world development and so forth like that, you see annual disagreement regarding growth rates during these countries, during, during these years, you see that there is a quite a lot of big variation through years, and here, for instance, is a very interesting case. This is a Penwell Tables who, for some reason, reports a minus 33% growth rate in, in, uh, in uh, 1988 for Tanzania. That never happened. Uh, it's beyond dispute. That's just a, a clerical er error in Pennsylvania. Yet, uh, it does enter the handbook of economic growth as the second largest output shock uh, recorded in history. Yeah, it was never recorded, it was uh, clerically entered in Pennsylvania. So that shows a little bit the, the danger of going from, uh, uh, that you go to very very close to statistical fiction when the distance between the observer and the observed is, is increasing. So that means that any ranking of African countries according to GDP is going to be misleading uh, it might be uh, reflecting data itself rather than actually the economies you're, you're looking at. Uh, any statement of growth, when we know now that Nigeria has only found 89% of itself, uh, then you would be a bit hesitant to say with any certainty whether growth is currently 5, 8 or 9, for anyone else number out there. Um, so then what does this matter for governance? Here I would introduce you to what is pol policy. Uh, so 
policy is a course of principle of action adopted or proposed by an organizational individual. It basically says uh, that the governance is then saying, you know, if some policy says if something happens, we will do this. So then the governance is determined on having facts of the world and then having a determined, predetermined action if cer such a such situation should appear. So evidence-based policy is a policy that's based on, on, on facts and then reacts to facts. So then basically you should be uh, collecting evidence, disseminate evidence, then the politician should formulate the policy, then collect evidence about how it does it look like now, and then say what you should do about the policy. That's in the textbook. But if the numbers are this soft, you'll have to question yourself whether this is likely to occur. So I suggest that we must think about the situations where sometimes you think you have evidence-based policy, but actually you have policy-based evidence, which is exactly the opposite of what you would like. Yeah? So the case in which the policy determines your evidence rather than the other way. And this means, for instance, an example says that in the 1990s in Kenya, donors instituted payment for results. They said, right Kenya, we won't be just giving, doling out money anymore. Now you have to show that your primary school enrollments are increasing. Very well, sir. We'll see to that. And after the donor payments came through, administrative sources showed increase. Oh, lo and behold, congratulations. The, the intervention is now working where primary school enrollments is up. But then someone else did a survey of asking actually households, did you go to school today? Did you go to school today? And they found out that the administrative data were wrong. They were, uh, the primary school enrollments were way overrated, overstated, which is not so strange because the individual school were financially rewarded by reporting how many people went to school. So they were kind of asking for the problem. But this also showed that the survey, survey showed that, so after the intervention, there was a gap between administrative data and survey data, before the, serve, before the intervention there was no such gap. So in this sense you have an evidence-based policy, which the only evidence we can find is that we can find manipulation of statistics. Yeah? We do not know now how many, whether the intervention increased enrollments. What we do know that post that policy intervention is that the government now does not know what happened to enrollments. It comes to, to poverty, data, deprivation. Some of you might have uh, seen uh, the General Secretary of the UN getting to the podium uh, this year in 2015 announcing that the uh, Millennium Development Goals were met and most importantly that world poverty was halved. I would submit to him that then he let the PR department write his speeches rather than his statistical department because as of today we only have poverty data for the most of the world in 2012. Yeah? The data for 2015 will not be ready until 2018. It takes that long time from you decide to collect the survey till the data is ready. So he's making a brave statement about the future, uh, the UN Secretary General. He also failed to mention that even in 2012 we only have data points, satisfactory data points, out in 63 of the 150 countries we're interested in monitoring economy. He also mentioned, failed to mention that the base year for halving this poverty was set in 1990 at a time where we only knew something about less than a third. Yeah? So we're doing a lot of gaps here and a lot of, it seems to me that sometimes when it comes to writing speeches about poverty, then the PR department gets uh, priority on, on statistics. So data users uh, need to question your evidence. Uh, if you're downloading data from an international organization, uh, you want to know uh, where that data came from. It's stunning to see that uh, researchers and organizations and journalists would be very, very hesitant of using its number if it is published by the Sudanese Statistical Department, but more than happy to publish that same number as long as it's been recycled through the World Bank. Although, of course, the World Bank has no such quality check or anything. They just you know, get the data, put them in there, and then send them back out. Uh, so it also means that data disseminators need to label their products better. Uh, I don't know exactly what, but maybe sometimes if the data is actually not data, as in something that is given, maybe there should be a red coloring or something. In the Zambian Statistical Office, they used to have this uh, operation that they had in a, a star, an asterisk, one star if it was a guesstimate, and two stars if it was a very weak guesstimate. 
I still don't know the difference between a guesstimate and a very weak guesstimate, but uh, it might be that you're guessing when you're tired or otherwise. But, uh, but anyhow, so I'm not here to set the, the standard. I'm just saying that the standard is required. Uh, donors need to coordinate. It very often means, as I document many cases in the book, is that the, the demand for evidence comes from donors to justify to their voters. That means that they will disregard uh, the need for data within the political system they are intervening into. Uh, and that needs to coordinate particularly with, with governments. And data producers then need to find and align their priorities. Sometimes, of course, ignorance is bliss, but many, most presidents in Sub-Saharan Africa are elected on delivering more jobs, though none of these presidents have any databases to be saying anything about what size of the problem it is or what it's going to happen to it or have any plan for how they're going to know anything about what's happening to unemployment while they're in office. Uh, so there needs to be some kind of closeness um, and so forth. So I suggest that a new agenda for data for development is required where local demand, incentives and applicability is at the center. So numbers matter. Any evaluation of the development experience must begin and end with a careful evaluation of the evidence. Without such analysis, one runs the risk of reporting statistical fiction, decision about what to measure, who to count, and by whose authority the final number is selected do matter. And then in conclusion, that poor numbers are too important to dismiss as just that. Thank you very much.